thanks very much for the friendly welcome. You know, um, I'm, I'm still, I just told Bren a little bit earlier that I'm still waiting for the day when somebody will throw the first rotten tomato at me for talking about climate change because most people don't like the topic and they think, uh, oh, well, all these people talking about mitigation and, you know, uh, impacts on, on businesses, that's not good. We don't want that. So um, thanks for that. A special honor to be here, actually, because I found out last night that the University of Queensland belongs to the best top 50 universities in the world. And I think Lund University is just somewhere barely within the top 100. So thanks for inviting me. Great honor. Um, climate change. Um, I mean, I'm almost surprised to see such a great interest in the topic because I think what we see in reality is that most people are already fed up with the topic, you know, climate change. Uh, quite, you know, there was a peak in 2007 and Al Gore coming up and, you know, the movie, you might have seen it when he moves up on his ladder and things like that. And people sort of, that's my feeling, get a little bit fed up with climate change. And that's because the issue might have come to our attention very quickly within just, you know, basically in 2007 that was peaking in no time um, for many reasons. But uh, if you look back in time, it should have come to our attention the topic far earlier because essentially the message of the third, fourth uh, assessment report by the IPCC wasn't so different from the first assessment report. Uh, and the message is essentially we have to reduce emissions of uh, greenhouse gases. Now obviously you could ask how can it be that a topic that's so essential to us, the use of energy, is uh, so little considered in our daily decision making? Uh, why is it that we haven't early on focused on energy issues because energy production is uh, and consumption is then, um, connected to climate change? And I think one of the reasons is that energy has been a non-issue to most of us. If I asked you how much do you pay on a monthly or annual basis for electricity at home, how many could answer that question? Couple. <laughs> Well, I sort of regularly uh, ask that question, and I can tell you that uh, in, in Sweden, my students can never tell me. Maybe 20% can tell me. Uh, but that should come as, as a surprise, because energy, obviously, is the backbone of our economies. It's very important to industrialized countries, and yet we have so little knowledge of energy, energy production, and the problems associated with energy production. And then it gets even more complicated when we talk about climate change as a consequence of energy consumption. Uh, because climate change is even more abstract than time and space. You've never seen climate change, have you? Uh, and we, when we talk about climate uh, greenhouse gases, then uh, probably it's even more complicated because you have never seen carbon dioxide or tasted it or you know, smelled it or whatever or touched it. And then the impacts are in the future. So how should we relate to such a complicated topic? It's a huge problem. And then obviously there's a lot of uh, media, are um, headlines that climate change might not be real, that you know, there are scientists saying this and scientists saying that. But in reality, as a colleague uh, at a conference said 10 years ago in, in uh, Canada, uh, probably 99.9% .9 of all scientists are in agreement that climate change is for real and that it's man-made, mostly. But in the media, um, you have a 50-50 presentation. Actually, there was one article back in 2004 show, showing that even 53% of all media articles that were analyzed for that uh, purpose were showing that climate change might not be for real. So in the public perception, there's still that image that climate change might be something that's made up by a group of scientists who have a great interest in getting new research funds. And uh, hence, the first couple of pictures, very quickly, just to tell you some basics about climate change. Um, what we have to understand is that our temperatures um, throughout the world are a result of incoming solar radiation. And that, that's a constant. The, the per square meter we have 342 watts uh, of incoming solar radiation. That's always constant. And then we have about the same amount of radiation going out of the system and some heat is trapped that essentially uh, gives us the temperature distribution that we have on a global level. So temperature, what we always talk about, it, uh, talk about in terms of uh, increase in global temperatures is measured as radiative forcing in scientific terms. Then um, second, oh yeah, sorry, one, two, that. Then there's different greenhouse gassing, 
gases con contributing to, to um, global warming. It's not just CO2. Um, what you see in this slide is like the positive contribution by different greenhouse gases and the cooling by, different uh, by another set of greenhouse gases that together makes this kind of contribution uh, to climate change. And if you compare that with 1.66 watts per square meter to the overall radiation that's coming in, 342, it's quite a tiny bit of change. Uh, that we are causing through the injection of uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. But this makes, is enough sufficient to increase the temperature on a global level. And it's increasing uh, by, well, about 0.7 degrees Celsius uh, over the past 150, 160 years. Since, uh, eight, since the 1850s, we have temperature measurements, and these you can compare to an increase in temperatures. These are regression lines, various regression lines over different time horizons. And that what you see is that the shorter you, the time horizon that you choose for uh, putting a regression line in observed temperature changes, the more rapidly the temperatures are increasing. So this is what we can observe. If you don't believe in climate change, there's also a very simple experiment. It's called the Coca-Cola experiment. It's not any kind of advertisement, any soda pop will do. Uh, take two bottles, one liter bottles, empty them by half, shake them both, open one, release the carbon, uh, carbon dioxide that is in the bottle, put the cap on again, put them both in the sun, put a thermometer on the back, and you will see a discernible difference in between uh, the two bottles if you put them in the sun. So there's very easy ways of showing greenhouse gases work and that will work even in the future. These are the projections for global climate change. Uh, temperature increases in the future up to 2100. And as you can see, there are different scenarios. And some people usually might say, well, there's uncertainty. You can see that. Nobody knows, really. Well, that's depending on the amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that we'll be injecting into the atmosphere in the future. That is the reason. If you stopped injecting greenhouse gases now, all over the world, then you would still have a slight increase. That's because of the system reacting to the long-term change. But if you inject more, you can have different scenarios, and you can see up to 4 degrees Celsius global warming might be likely up to 2100. I'll be coming back to that. Now, in uh, 2007, uh, a group of eight scientists was then asked by UNWTO uh, to write a report on tourism and climate change. That means how tourism would be affected by global climate change, but also how tourism contributes to global climate change. And uh, that's the report uh, uh, Brent was uh, mentioning earlier, climate change and tourism responding to global, uh, to global uh, challenges that uh, we wrote back in 2007, was published and presented in Davos in 2008. In this uh, report, we look at um, a number of issues. Um, I can't talk about all of them, but this is the state-of-the-art document that's uh, available for free download um, from UNWTO. Um, and um, I think it's better than any of the books that are on the market. It's more comprehensive. It's the most comprehensive document so far. Still, we have a lot of research gaps. Uh, first of all, where will climate change occur and what will that mean for tourism? And Dan Scott came up with um, four different categories. The fourth one I'll be talking about in a second. Direct changes in climate, how, for instance, season length and quality might be affected by climate change. That is a key um, issue. Then how environmental resources for tourism might be changing. For instance, if we lose coral reefs, certain species, how that will affect tourism. Then overall economic growth and stability, also a very important factor in the future development of tourism. And the fourth issue that I will be talking about in some more detail, mitigation policy, how we have to change uh, emissions from tourism in the future and what that might mean for tourism. These are the four broad topics that we have to look at. Um, in terms of the this one, the third one, we don't know much. The Stern Review, you might have heard about, uh, is a document that takes up uh, quite a lot of those things, how the global economic system might be affected by climate change in the future. Uh, but we looked into more detail into these two in the report. And um, um, just to give you uh, some kind of idea of the time scales before I go into this, um, the problem with the different topics is that, you know, 
most of the changes will be in the future. So if you look at certain things like snow reliability in, in winter sports, uh, it, it might not be before the 2030s that these changes become important. Um, in terms of water supply, same thing. Health of coral reefs, that might be even more into the future. So when we talk about adaptation of how we should adjust to climate change, then most of these things are in the future, except for one issue, um, and that's <coughs> mitigation politics. I think the most important climate change issue at the moment uh, should thus for us be climate change mitigation politics, because that will affect tourism uh, probably more rapidly than any of the other changes. Now, um, what do we know, what don't we know? Um, you can see that uh, this map was drawn up by Dan Scott as well in, in Canada, University of Waterloo. Um, and there's very many issues that you could look at. We looked at warmer summers, warmer winters, how they might affect tourism. Increase in extreme events, uh, sea level rise, land biodiversity loss, marine biodiversity loss, water scarcity, political destabilization, increase in disease outbreaks, and travel cost increase for mitigation policy. And uh, there are a lot of um, uncertainties. We have a number of studies in, for instance, the Caribbean, uh, Mediterranean, uh, Indian Ocean, small island nations, and so on. But in South America, Africa, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia, there are virtually no studies at all that uh, look into these issues. And um, in Australia, I come back to that, you have now two very comprehensive studies uh, that at least on a case study level look into uh, those areas that might be most effective. But there are regional knowledge gaps that we have uh, to consider. There's also a major problem here because while we can sp uh, specify many of the changes that will be occurring because of climate change, what we can't is a perceptional issue. We have very little knowledge about some changes that might occur and how those will then affect tourism. For instance, if there was a possibility to physically engage in skiing, say if they had snowmaking all over here and you could come down all the way from here down here, but the landscape would be totally different than the winter landscape that you would expect in a winter holiday destination. Would tourists still come? We don't know. So there is a huge problem here. Same with this. That was uh, two years ago, my, my annual holiday on the Swedish island of um, Öland. Very interesting. Uh, the most beautiful beaches you could imagine, uh, but the sea like an oil spill. This is algae. What is the perception of those people here? It was my holiday, so I didn't go around and ask. I should have. But uh, I, I know there were many international tourists as well, because you could hear people speak English and so on. But would they come back in the next year after such an experience? You tell me, because I don't know. So we have a lot of strategical gaps here, and I think one of the most important gaps is the perception gap. Because we don't know much about the understanding of tourists of certain changes. And, um, there are a number of publications that have tried to quantify the changes in tourist flows on a global scale because of changing, uh, a changing climate. And I can only warn you to take these verbatim because I don't know uh, if these studies would actually make a good point.